Before I introduce the moderator, I would like to quote the last student chair to serve on the committee of lectures during Fern's reign. <laughs> she served from 1999 until December 2010. To quote Claire Wandro, I really do hope the audience enjoys the evening half as much as we enjoyed working with Fern and the committee. She always brightened and enlightened and serious discussions were always about having issues and also speakers with colorful jokes and stories. And I had an awesome time of working just a semester <laughs> with Fern and she's been an awesome ever since. And now here is Steve Sullivan, the Director of Community Relations for Mary Reilly Medical Center and the movie reviewer for the Ames Tribune. In a former life, he held here at Iowa State's new service, which which why he returns from time to time to join us. Enjoy the night. Hi, um, I was given the choice to uh, introduce uh, Fern and Joe or the Spotted Owl. Um, <laughs> it was hard, but they're friends. I've known them longer than the Spotted Owl, so I decided to be here. And I'm very pleased to have been asked to do this. Um, Fern Kupfer and Joe Giha uh, are both retired from the Iowa State uh, University Creative Writing Program. They've written lots of stuff, and their work has appeared in many, many places. Fern has been in Newsweek, Newsday, Cosmopolitan, The Chronicle of Higher Education, and Parents Magazine. Her books include the very moving memoir, Before and After Zachariah, as well as the novels No Regrets, Love Lies, and Surviving the Seasons, which was a Jewish Book Award nominee. Joe's fiction has been awarded the Pushcart Prize and was chosen for inclusion in the permanent collection of the Smithsonian Institution's Arab American Archive. He's a recipient of a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, and his work has appeared in numerous periodicals, including Esquire Magazine, The New York Times, The Northwest Review, The Iowa Review, and Oxford Magazine. And that's all the official bio stuff. Now you get a little personal. Um, Joe and Fern have great affection and appreciation for their beginnings, their roots, their origins. Fern, growing up a nice Jewish girl in Long Island, which has shaped much of her writing, including her new memoir, which will, she'll be speaking about tonight, Leaving Long Island. And Joe, born in Lebanon, Lebanon, excuse me, um, and then coming to America and growing up in Toledo in the Emigrant uh, Arab American community, experience that shaped his lovely collection of short stories through and through Toledo stories, and his new novel, Lebanese Blonde, which is just a killer title. <laughs> Anybody who knows these two know they are crazy about good food, good movies, good books, good conversation. But I think um, what we all appreciate most is they're kind of crazy about each other which makes it just a pleasure to be around them. Individually, each of them is loads of fun. Funny, smart, generous, and in Fern's case, highly opinionated. <laughs> but together, well, that's a completely different deal and a, and a great one, and we get a little taste of that tonight. So uh, please uh, join me in welcoming two of my favorite people, Fern Kupfer and Joe Giha. get to go first. Th this is so nice. I am so thrilled to be here, and I'm kind of overwhelmed. I have had been on lectures for so many years, and I always had hostess anxiety that we're paying these people to come, get an audience, and no one would come. And so I bullied so many of my friends and my bridge group and my reading groups to come. And there are even people here who I do not know. Um, <laughs> But when I was teaching, I used to always require students to come, and that's why I had this hostess anxiety. Um, I, I would like to thank so much the Lectures Committee, the English Department for sponsoring us. Um, I'd like to thank um, my editor from Calissa Day Press, Mikesh, who's here tonight, who's been wonderful to work with. And of course, I'd like to thank um, the How Does She Do It, Pat Miller, who puts on the best lectures program in the country.
When I served for so many years as faculty chair of lectures, I was always financially conservative. I was socially liberal, but very financially conservative, so they would come with a budget, and I would say, uh, oh, do we have to pay that much, and let's try to get down, and I would just like to tell you all that tonight, Joe and I are not getting paid anything at all. I'd also like to thank Joyce Veggie because when I was walking downtown and putting up posters for this because I was so nervous that nobody was going to come, I went into the store, Teal and Tenacious, and she said, I have something back there that would look so cute on you, Fern. And she took it out, and so I said, wow, this really is, it's very cute, and I, and I bought it. So it only cost, <laughs> it cost a little over $100 to put up that poster in the window. <laughs> Um, we're going to talk tonight um, about our books and a little kind of conversation about what it's like to be married to a writer. It's great to be married to a writer. It is like having, for a writer, it's like having your own private English teacher live with you all the time. When you are in a good marriage, your partner says, ooh, don't go out in that, you know, ooh, you have a stain on your belly, ooh, maybe you should put on a different tie. Um, and so you have someone who's built in who's never going to make you look stupid or ashamed because they monitor you. And when you're married to a writer and you are a writer, when you send stuff out, that person does monitor you. Um, and and it's, it's, it's so wonderful to do that. So we both criticize each other's work. Um, we always read everything the other person read. Someone asked, oh, you just had these books come out together. And it was kind of serendipitous that we both did. We did not plan this. I finished my book after two years, and after 15 or 20, uh, Joe finished his novel. <laughs> and it just so happened that it came out in the same month. So it's really exciting to do this together. And someone said, well, do you feel competitive in any way? And I was surprised at that. Uh, the answer for both of us is no. I mean, I am thrilled at any phone call, any, Joe just got a great um, review and book list, so we're always thrilled for each other. I did say to him, our books are coming out together, I said, if one of us really makes it big, I hope it's me. <laughs> Not a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I said before we were doing this, I said, you know, people are always going to ask, what is your book about? And you have to have, you know, I did book, big book tours, I have interviews, and it, yeah, you need a sound bite for that. What is your book about? So I'm going to start with a, a short reading because this talk is called Another uh, Arab Jewish Potluck. And... Um, Pat Miller did get a lot of calls from people who said, is the food before or after the reading? <laughs> There's no food. You, you, you can go to Joe's cooking demonstration. He's doing Gihas Fihas, and there'll be food there at Cook's Emporium downtown. Uh, that, so there'll be food there um, with his book. <laughs> um, this title, Another Arab Jewish Potluck, comes from an essay that I wrote years ago, and I incorporated it in the memoir, Leaving Long Island, a woman called me from Iowa City and she said, would I contribute an article to a collection that she was doing called um, Cross-Cultural Marriages, something like that. And I said, you know, well, I, I didn't think I was in a cross-cultural marriage. And she said, well, aren't you Jewish? And I said, well, yeah. And she said, and aren't you married to an Arab? And it just seemed very, and so I said, okay, you know, it was, a, it was an essay, they were going to pay me $1,000, so I said, okay, I will, I will write that. And I thought about it. Um, and so this is, this, um, this is we're each going to do three very short readings, and we're going to go back and forth. I will let him speak, but <laughs> not that much. No, I <laughs> um, And so this very short piece that I'm going to read is from the part that is another Arab Jewish potluck uh, that is a part of the book. Winter. 
1990. Picture this. My second husband and I, married less than a year, are in Florida at a party for my parents' 50th wedding anniversary. In celebration of this achievement, my parents are flying to Israel in a few days. Their lifelong friends are all at this party, Sylvia and Harold, Leona and Carl, Bernice and Harry. They are talking with great enthusiasm about Israel, about the trips they have all taken. One couple attended a grandson's bar mitzvah in Israel, a family highlight. My husband enters the conversation, an innocent. He says he would love to go to Israel someday. He was sorry not to have been able to visit when he was in the Middle East in the early 70s. In the Middle East without going to Israel? Someone clucks in sympathy. I was in Egypt, he says, in Syria, in Lebanon for a few weeks before the Civil War, he goes on. My parents' friends look puzzled. How could anyone go to the Middle East and not make Israel the prime destination? So close and you didn't get to Israel, someone asks. Why not? Joe's not Jewish, I tell my parents' friends, gently letting them know that Israel does not have the same meaning. There is the assumption that because he is my husband, because he is short and dark and looks like a lot of other men in the room, that Joe is Jewish. Well, I wanted to go to Israel. I'm making him sound like he has a Jewish accent. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I wanted to go to Israel, my husband says. I would have loved to have gone, but I couldn't. The friends are immediately attentive. I hold my breath. You couldn't? Finally, someone responds. Now everyone looks totally confused. My husband goes on to explain that because he was born in Lebanon, there was a problem. You see, my passport was limited to a hush falls over the room as I watch the looks on their faces, confusing enough that my second husband has the same first name as my first, who many of my parents' friends had known since I was a teenager confusing enough that this was a man whom I said had sole custody of his young daughters. What could the mother have done? Okay, so he wasn't Jewish. Their generation was just getting used to mixed marriages, the divorces, a gay son, lesbian daughter. But this? Ruth and Milton's daughter had actually gone and married one of them? This swarthy man before them? Yes. He really is an Arab? Comedian Lenny Bruce used to have a routine in which he made the distinction between Goyish and Jewish. Goyish is a kind of pejorative for Gentile, for, for non-Jew. Trailer parks and lime jello and the Marine Corps are Goyish. <laughs> Condominiums and rye bread and accounting are Jewish. <laughs> Everyone in the Midwest is Gentile. So, except the grad walls, uh, <laughs> even if they're not, especially, uh, um, oh, even if they're not, everyone in New York is Jewish, even if they're not, especially Italians. Italians are very Jewish. And so, might I add, are Arabs, which is why Joe and I seem so at home in each other's skin, as if we came from the same place. To illustrate, Here's another story with my parents living in Florida when Joe and I were visiting one time early in our new marriage. Joe is in the bathroom, but the door is open, and he is rummaging through the medicine chest looking for the sinus medication that I had put away. From the hall, I hear him, and I ask if he is looking for aspirin. No, he calls back. I'm just taking one of these. In the doorway, he shakes the prescription bottle. What's he taking, calls my mother from the kitchen. Is he taking a pill? Then my father yells in from the bedroom, is he sick? What's the matter with him? What's he taking? <laughs> if my grandparents were still alive, they too would be calling from their respective places in the house. Joe looks at me and smiles. I feel like I'm back on Monroe Street, he says. Monroe Street is where he lived with his family above the store. It is the intrusiveness, I think, a kind of well-meaning, busy-bodiedness that characterized our homes and separated Joe and me from the more emotionally remote families, the ones my family called the Goyim. 
what Joe's family referred to as the Americani. My turn. You know, uh, Fern and I, uh, she does read everything I write, but I learned early on not to uh, give her anything that was in progress. I show her something that's been written because my comparison is, I, I did it a few times, I'd show her something, and she looked at me, well, why is this person here? I said, I don't know yet. I said, well, well who is, he? Is, he, is that his cousin? Was he? I don't know yet, I'm still figuring. She gets very upset with you. Uh, and I, my comparison is, Showing her something that you've not uh, finished yet is like covering yourself in fish oil and jumping into a cage full of ocelots. <laughs> and that's not an exaggeration. Uh, people ask me what my book is about, and uh, for the longest time <laughs> I was writing it, I couldn't answer that question. I, Give me a minute, will you? Give me a minute. I don't know. Uh, a Lebanese blonde tells the story of Sam, who's a, a Lebanese immigrant, and his cousin Aboudi. I happen to have a brother named Aboudi, but it's not the guy in the story. <laughs> Although he's very proud of it. When you, when you read the book, you'll see he really shouldn't be. Uh, <laughs> and his attempt to bring him into a hashish smuggling scheme that uses the family funeral home business as a cover. Their efforts are complicated by the beginnings of the 1975 Lebanese Civil War and the arrival of Tayyib, who's a, a war refugee, maybe a cousin, who is suffering from what looks like post-traumatic stress syndrome, and by Sam's own doubts and concerns. But that's an awful lot to say what the book is about. Uh, Generally, though, in a larger sense, the book is uh, about immigrants, and it's about immigration. Every one of the characters is an immigrant or a child of immigrants, and they live in an immigrant community in Toledo, uh, Ohio, called, uh, which is known familiarly as Little Syria. Little Syria, in the old days, uh, all Lebanese and Syrians were called Syrians, and in the older days, they were called Turks. But... Uh, uh, so the little Syria w developed about the time they were being called Turks, around the uh, turn of the 19th century to the 20th century, uh, uh, was when uh, little Syria was founded. And by 1975, when the story is being told, it's beginning to evaporate right under Sam's feet, this refuge that he's had. Uh, to establish uh, the scope, this large scope of the book, which is about immigration. It's about what immigration does to you, what you do to where you immigrate, because not only are you affected by immigration, but you affect where you immigrate. Uh, I open the novel with a kind of a history lesson, and I'm going to read the opening passages. Before we know it, that was how Uncle Yusuf liked to begin his funeral homilies with an American phrase he'd adopted to mean, once upon a time. Before we know it, the ship stop in New York Harbor, he would announce to the congregation, and we step down on Ellis Island. Yusuf's voice was high-pitched, and he sprayed his S's. Step, Ellis. Children in the congregation tittered to see the spit fly lifting their faces as they followed its arc up into the ceiling lights and then down again toward the casket positioned directly beneath the pulpit between a double row of candlesticks. The casket was kept open during the homily, awaiting the final administering of ashes and holy water. He first come here, Yusuf continued, pointing down at the silk-covered face, the same year McKinley died, or... She come the year before McKinley was shot, or two years after. An assassination, rather than the turning of a century, was the hallmark by which an entire generation had signaled its arrival. Settling into America, they grew old with the century. And as they grew old and began to die off one by one, Yusuf spoke at their funerals. Archdeacon of St. Elias Church, 
educated in the seminaries of Antioch and Damascus, and so almost a priest. He would recount in the formal intonations of high Arabic how, before we know it, ticket agents were riding up Mount Lebanon on donkey back, sent by steamship companies that needed people to fill their steerage holds. In village after village from the Bika Valley in the north down to the mountain, to the mouth of the Litani River, they announced cheap passage. Just imagine it, America, where one finds gold lying in the streets. At the beginning, only a few bought tickets, those few anticipating the crash of the silk industry and understanding that nothing would be left for them after that, not even the work their fathers had done all their lives long, said to one another, Yalla, let's go. So they went, the trickle before the flood. For those who remained, mail began to arrive from America. There were letters to be read aloud by those who could read, and there was something else in the envelopes, American dollars. Wallah, they had indeed struck gold. Here Yusuf liked to pause, briefly raising both hands to his shoulders as if in benediction, his tiny frame so compressed by age he could barely see over the pulpit's lectern. So the rest of us packed up what we could not sell off, and we followed. They never came here to stay, Yusuf stressed this. They came here to take the gold back with them and live out their days like pashas in the most beautiful mountains of the most beautiful country in all the world. But, he would add, the first step away takes you all the way away. So that in the end, who remembers the old country? He pondered his own question. Over the years, Yusuf's eyebrows and mustache had remained black, while the hair of his head had turned iron gray. Forget the old country. You rolled up your sleeves instead. You learned the money first, then the language. Books and schools were for your children, not for you. America grasps you by the ankles of your children. Here Yusuf would fall silent, wait for the high piping echo of his own voice to fade. That trip back to the old country you were planning to take in five years, before you know it, 10 years. Before you know it, 15. Before you knew it, a two-week charter tour in the summer, excursion fair, after your children have sold the store. With luck, you would make it back in time to die in the shadow of Mount Sunin under the grape arbor of the village where your family name was born. But even that is not the end. No, in the end, your children will send for your body, have it boxed up and brought back to America to be buried. Your dust, now American dust. You know, jo Joe's book is a novel and mine is a memoir. It's a fictional novel, you know. Uh, but there's truth in a novel, and there's artifice in a memoir. And, you know, when, when, you, when you write a memoir and then people call to tell you things that you got wrong, um, there's, there's a lot of artifice sometimes. What, being married to a writer, uh, you have to listen to the same stories over and over again. Actually, some of my friends have to listen to the same stories over and over again. But, um, it, and, and you do it in a way that, you know, you show, oh, this is still interesting. Years and years ago, there are probably a couple of people here who remember the Lushes, Jay Lush, anyone? He, they were, when I came here in my late 20s, I think they were in their 80s. And I remember my first husband, I invited them over for tea, which, I didn't even know what, how to make tea. And, um, and, he, and Jay Lush told a story, and Mrs. Lush was looking at him with apparently love and interest, and I thought, how many times has she heard this story over and over again? Uh, and I had a story about my grandmother coming to America that Joe has heard over and over again, and I had included this in my memoir. And the amazing thing is, she also um, uh, judged it by coming to America when McKinley was shot. So I, I 
apparently when McKinley was shot, a lot of people came to this country. So this is true. Where are these glasses? <laughs> Grandma came to America by herself when she was just a girl at the beginning of the last century. President McKinley had just been assassinated. The miracle of the New York subway was still being constructed. My grandmother joined the first exodus of European Jewry, not to seek her fortune or escape religious oppression, but to avoid a shidduch, the arranged marriage of her mo uh, that her mother had begun. The intended was a man from her village, a butcher nearly twice her age. It was all very fiddler on the roof. Her intended was older, but it was not so much age that bar bothered my grandmother, it was height. The groom was apparently short. My grandmother, ever feisty and probably the most difficult of teenagers, had made an arrangement of her own, a plan to get a look before the engagement. She arranged for this man to be in the square under the town clock. The story she used to tell sitting around the kitchen table in the Bronx, and I had heard it many, many times, she liked telling it. I took one look at him and told my mother, you marry him, I am going to America. <laughs> my grandfather was tall, penniless and illiterate when she knew him as a nice boy from her village, but tall. My grandmother came a few years before he did and sponsored him, lying and listing him as a brother. She didn't want to, you know, have to get married because uh, then she didn't want to list him as a fiance because then she felt, you know, that she'd have to do that. Papa was an illegal immigrant. He was also a good man, quiet, hard worker who never ever complained. A few years before the Depression, through years of sweat guilt, sweat guilt, he had saved enough to buy his family a modest four-family apartment house in the Bronx, but eventually his out-of-work tenants could not pay the rent. My tough grandmother had the better business sense. She wanted to give the family notice, make them move, get tenants who could pay. But how can I throw a family out into the street, Papa asked. Soon the bank took over, and my grandparents themselves were thrown out of the house that my grandfather had saved for. Uh, conflict is at the heart of storytelling. This is something that I used to teach when I taught creative writing. No conflict, no story. You need trouble, you need something. And Sam, the hero of my story, has plenty of conflicts to deal with. He's young for his age, he's clumsy, he's clueless, he has accidents, he screws up at work, he lives with his mother. His story is a coming of age story, growing up, stepping out into that big world out there. And this too can be seen as a conflict inherent in the immigrant experience. That is, the exotic versus the ordinary. Uh, the alien is exotic to the native and vice versa in uh, any number of ways. Language, food, music, religion, skin color, hair color, Lebanese, blonde. Uh, the, I feel like the, uh, the conflict is even there in the title. Uh, in presenting Sam's story, at the end of each chapter, I added a segment about Tayyib, the war refugee who's suffering from post-traumatic stress. Uh, I have a little section about him. I wanted him to seem more exotic and Sam to be more ordinary, and we're going to see them, through the course of the novel, come together uh, and uh, change one another in many ways. The, the two characters are in sharp contrast with one another, and to stress the contrast, not only do I change to italics and use present tense, whereas the rest of the stories and pa uh, storytellers past, I also use an elevated style of diction and rhythms and sentence construction that's almost poetic. Uh, and I'll give you a sample of that from the beginning of, uh, again, the book. And this is the introduction of, of the character we'll come to know as Tayyib. Khan Makan. When he tells his story, if he tells his story, this is how he will begin it. The way Hakawati, the itinerant storytellers, begin with Khan Makan, the Arabic once upon a time, which means perhaps this happened thus, perhaps it didn't. 
How else to relate his departure out of the Syrian desert, how he traveled west until he reached the green world? It is all Khan Makan, like memory itself. The memory of his childhood is a blur. His own age he cannot recount, neither the day nor the year of it, born to desert herders, poorest of the Philahin, to a forgotten name, La. His father calls him as if summoning a servant, one more worthless than white dust beneath their feet. He is not taught to read. Can the dust beneath one's feet be instructed? Nor to reckon numbers beyond his five sisters, one for each finger of his mother's hand. He recalls his mother's tattooed hand, reaching to light a kerosene lamp. Her hands shredding meat from roasted bones, showing him how it's done. Their brother counts them on his fingers. One, Hasna, the first to be sent away, bleeding like an animal. Then two, Rima, gone. Three, Fadwa. Four, Saha. Finally, even Basima the simple, the always smiling Basima. Five times he pleads as an elder brother ought, protests with anger and tears, cursing his father and then cursing his suffering mother too for the silence of her suffering, and five times he is punished, bent over a water trough, almost a grown man by the time his last sister is taken away. The girls are being given away to, uh, uh, in, as indentured servants in a sense, uh, to uh, be servants, uh, nannies, uh, carekeepers for the children of the matrons of Beirut and uh, Damascus. Uh, and never to be seen again. Afterward, when he is caught trying to pilfer money from his father's satchel, they are paper bills called piasters. He does not know their worth, but surely there must be enough left to buy back at least Basima, who has been sold to a toothless old man. His father punishes him for the thief he has become. In fury, his father uses the stock of the rifle to beat him, then he takes the goat tether and ties him by the ankles to the water trough. He leaves him that way, bleeding from the head, one eye swollen and closed, an entire day, an entire night. It is dawn again before he has worked both legs free. He flees west, traveling on foot and by night, despite the throbbing of his head, despite how the vision in his right eye blurs so that he must keep it half closed. By the second morning, he has reached the gardens bordering Damascus, watered by the river Barada in the Hamadi soup. His hunger is such that he tries to steal food. The approach of soldiers' boots chase him away, their rhythmic scrape and stamp. That night he crosses the Barada River, knee-deep now in the dry season. Driven by hunger, he climbs goat paths up and up toward the distant thin plumes of cooking fires, far up into the wilderness of the anti-Lebanon, where he leaves the goat paths, pushing through dense scrub to follow the waft and trace of hot, dripping fat. Uh, and so to contrast that, that's the end of the, the first chapter. I start the second chapter with... Again, the sense of smell, only this is where we take up with uh, Sam, who's had an accident, and now he's in the hospital, and the next chapter begins. And I'll just read the, uh, the opening sentence just to show you the contrast. It begins, the unmistakable aroma of cooked-to-death green beans wafted in through the hospital ventilation system, and then a hint of what? Meatloaf. Some people have gratuitous sex in their novels. Joe has gratuitous food. She writes the sex scene. I don't. They're not. <laughs> um, uh, what is your book about, and why would you write a memoir? Um, I, I had a book called Leaving Long Island, sitting in a drawer for a long time. It was a collection of essays loosely connected. And three years ago, I was diagnosed with the BRCA gene. Uh, that is a gene um, for hereditary breast cancer. All of the women in my family had breast cancer, except for one cousin. That's two grandmothers, aunts, my mom. And so it was something that I thought, oh, that I would get at one time. 
but I didn't think I had a genetic marker for it. Um, and when I went to the doctor here at the McFarland Clinic three years ago, um, it was suggested there was a genetics clinic there that I be tested for this gene. I was already in my 60s. I was very careful about my health, uh, but I thought I will do this for my daughter because this is a, um, what do you call that gene that's dominant? I knew there was a, science was not. It, it was a dominant gene, and so if I had it, it that would... Um, probably be passed to, get to Gabby. There would be a 50-50 chance it would be passed to my daughter, Gabby. Uh, so what my book is about, too, a memoir, it is about going through this, meeting lots of wonderful women who are so supportive. Uh, I think if you read that uh, piece in the Des Moines Register yesterday, it, it said, I, I, I looked at the breasts of a lot of women in public bathrooms, which made it sound a little sleazy, but that is not how... Yeah, um, I, I was going through trying to find out what to do uh, uh, to, just, to decide about the mastectomies, to decide about reconstruction. And, you know, women are terrific. They, they are. I just can't imagine men who have prostate cancer going and pulling down their pants in the stomping ground bathroom. But, but women did. We did. I, I saw a lot of people's breasts in the stomping ground bathroom. I mean, <laughs> we don't write about it. Um, the, you know, you go into the handicap stall, it's pretty big. Uh, I, I've been at the cafe where four women at the table, we went into the bathroom and we opened up our blouses to, to look at each other and... and, and, and and it, it, it was very wonderful. It was really nourishing. Um, I'm going to the FORCE conference in October, which is Face Our Risk of Cancer, some other letter acronym, which is also started by a woman who has this gene for breast cancer. And I met a wonderful sorority of women. It's not a sorority I would have chosen to join, but it was very helpful to me. And, um, and so that was part of why I wrote. You know, why People ask when you write a memoir, oh, is it healing for you to write? And I always, I, I feel I disappoint people when I say, really, it's not. I mean, it's not like it's a journal. So I had gone through it already, and then you make sense of it, and then you put it down um, a, a, as, as, you, as your story, and you own it already. This last piece that I'm going to read um, is about... <sighs> my daughter and whether or not she had the gene. And this scene is, I was at my high school reunion. It was the 40, I can't do the math. That was never, 45th, 46, I don't know, a couple of years ago, a, a high school reunion in Plainview, Long Island. And this was right after I found out I had the BRCA gene. And it was right after I had, I realized I'm going to have to make some decisions about taking out my insides, taking out my fallopian tubes, taking out my ovaries, taking off my breasts, really horrible decisions, and then flying to Long Island and going to this reunion. And I had a great time. I really did. You know, I just had a couple of drinks. I danced. I met people that I hadn't seen in a long time. Um, and a girl from my high school said, oh, you know, you were always such a happy girl. And I thought, you know, I am. I still am, even with this. But the idea of my daughter, my beautiful young daughter, having this gene weighed on me so, so heavily. So she was going for genetic testing as well. And I'm in New York with my best friend Barbara, and it's right before the high school reunion. I was in Barbara's living room when the phone rang. She looked at the caller ID. It's Gabby, she said. That's my daughter. Our eyes locked across the room. You pick it up, Barbara said. Gabby could not possibly know already. She's just calling to tell me to have a great time at the reunion. Still, please, 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 begins as a mantra in my head. Hi, sweetheart, I say, trying to sound upbeat. Mom? Gabby's voice is strangled, fraught with emotion. It seems as if she is about to burst out crying. People mix us up on the phone. Like it or not, she has my nasal voice. When I am at her house in Chicago, sometimes my ex calls, and I answer. Hi, hun, he says. 
his voice soft and loving. I stop him. This is Fern. I know that the hun is not meant for me. I cannot make out what Gabby is saying. She is crying. She cannot even get the words out. Then I hear, great news. I don't have it, Mom. I don't have it. I don't have the gene. What? I don't have it. I don't have the BRCA gene. It is as if, as if what? Words fail me for the happiness born of relief, the exuberant, extraordinary gratitude of nothing happened. Mothers have known this in the most mundane circumstances. You are at the beach. You put on sunscreen, straighten the blanket. You look into the picnic basket, trying to find the sandwich the child has requested, one without mustard. And when you look up, suddenly, she is not there. You scan the next blanket and the next one down the sand and out into the waves. Terra mounts, the air so close and hot. Panic rises like bile in your throat. You call. You can hardly say her name aloud, for saying it will give the validation that she is missing. Everyone around you is calm. No one is close to fainting the way you are. They don't know. The lapping waves are black. But before the screaming starts, you see her, the blonde toddler digging in the sand in the shadow of the next umbrella. And that is the moment, the moment when everything is exactly the same as it was before, but different, because your prayer has been answered, and you are at that moment with all of your being grateful. Everything is the same as it was. I don't have it, Mom, Gabby says again. The genetics clinic just called me with the news. I ask her to explain everything to me, to repeat the conversation exactly. I am aware of Barbara standing next to me, quiet, as I fall to my knees, sobs escaping from a very deep down place. It's the problem is following her act, too, you know. Um, uh, for my final piece, I'd like to show one other thing that I, I deal with uh, in terms of immigration, uh, the general theme of this book. Uh, and it's uh, the fact that almost uh, uh, all immigrants uh, encounter a fear of, of losing yourself. Uh, and your heritage into the melting pot. Everybody talks about how nice it is to join the melting pot, but uh, what are you going to lose? Uh, what part of you is going to remain? Will any of you remain? Will you know yourself afterward? Uh, so they cling to, uh, at the beginning, they cling to their language. Uh, they teach their kids the language sometimes, not, uh, but more and more they don't. They cling to food, to music. Uh, they live together in immigrant communities like little Syria, and they share common myths, too, and they accept these myths, like uh, the example uh, that the Lebanese make such shrewd traders and, and uh, uh, salespeople, you know, they're very good at selling, good at commerce, uh, which reminds me that uh, uh, Dr. Nassif here, uh, he's right over here, and he's, uh, 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 he came to America on the same boat I did, the Volcania, only 10 years later. We found that out over a poker game. It's a very small world. Uh, but he uh, is having a sale on fine Turkish and Persian rugs. <laughs> and I have these handouts to, and I'm going to put them over there at the table. And the profits going to cystic fibrosis. And believe me, they are beautiful, high quality rugs at enormously great prices. <laughs> believe me, no, no, no joke. Okay, I'll, I'll have that over there for you, and it's got the information, and if you need a Turkish rug, and you do. <laughs> Dr. Nassif. You hired me. Okay, good. Uh, anyway, uh, back to, uh, is there uh, anything left after you assimilate? Uh, is there any more a sense of us? Uh, here's a scene where Sam faces this question, and also some of the intrusiveness uh, from family that Fern mentioned earlier. 
Uh, this scene takes place, uh, it's after a Sunday dinner. The extended family is watching 60 Minutes. It's 1975, maybe early 76 by now. And the war uh, in Lebanon is escalating, and 60 Minutes is doing a bit about it. And it, it's showing uh, uh, some horrible scenes. A uh, car bomb had gone off in the Martyrs Square, which is in downtown Beirut. And uh, they show little children who are, uh, you know, the camera scans over uh, these, these bodies and the wounded children and the, and the dead ones. And uh, phone, phone rings, interrupts, and the news comes that uh, Uncle Waxy, who's in the hospital, has regained consciousness, and everybody rushes to their cars, and they uh, make a dash for the hospital. And on the way, Sam says, Sam and Abudi are in uh, this scheme together to smuggle Lebanese blonde hashish from the old country during a civil war. Uh, and in the back are the uh, three old ladies, his mother and two aunts. Listen, bud, Sam said, what we just saw on TV, those car bombs, one of them went off in the Hamra district, close to the American embassy. The announcer said the State Department's already begun tightening travel restrictions to Lebanon. So, so, you think, you think something like that isn't going to cause a serious hitch? In the back seat, the women had gone totally silent with listening. Uh, Sam feels uh, that if the war, if, if this does escalate into a full-fledged civil war, uh, their smuggling scheme just can't work. Not us, a booty waved away the very idea. It's not in our blood. What's that supposed to mean? We're business people. Look at Beirut, built on international banking. Look at our history, overseas traders, merchants, way back before Bible times even. Sam thought he heard a grunt of approval from the back seat. So what, he said. So look at the news we're seeing now, and not that State Department crap. I mean news from the street. Some poor chump's grocery store gets blown to bits, and two days later, Two days later, he's selling melons out of a push cart, and he's turning a profit. They're business people over there, cuz, and business people don't let things stay bad, not for long anyway, unless the war itself happens to be the business. What's that supposed to mean? Come on, a booty. You don't think somebody's got to be making money off all this? We are beastful beebles. Uh, Arabic has no P sound. They replace it with a B. <laughs> Aunt Afifi couldn't resist adding her two cents. In the rear view, Sam could see her adjusting the volume knob on the listening device hanging in her bosom. I get this from my, uh, actually my cousin Siti, his grandmother. She was hard of hearing and she had an old fashioned hearing aid. One thing went in here and then there was a, a loudspeaker that hung in her bosom. And when she talked on the phone, it was very funny because she'd sit there with the phone like this, and she'd talk into here, and the listening was down here. It was, uh, so I had to use that. She, she's on the cover in the book, by the way, dead center, if you want to see, but you can't see the thing. But now Sam's mother also piped up, asserting in Arabic that, most truly, we are a peaceful people, and therefore we can hold our heads up to anyone. I suppose so, Ma, Sam said. A booty smirked, giving him a little nudge with his elbow. The two women began a running commentary while Aunt Nejla, seated between them, nodded in agreement and softly uttered Arabic encouragements. We are lawful people, eh, We are honorable, ma'loom. We don't do it, the shooting and the blowing up, mazboot. No, this is the other peoples, not us. Other people, Sam glanced up into the rear view, like who? His mother was ready with an answer, and she smiled. Il Irish, she said. They are on CBS every day, Il Irish, not us. Okay, not us. There is no us. Sam used to think that, 
listening to Uncle Yusuf go on and on about this small country at the great rock crossroads of East and West that had been repeatedly invaded over thousands of years by anybody and everybody, from Egyptians to Macedonians, from Mongols to Turks to European crusaders. Australians, too, and French Senegalese, Yusuf would hasten to add, recounting how the people of this small country were once natural sailors and pioneers, how they had founded Carthage and Syracuse, colonies on Malta and the coast of France and Spain, and some claimed beyond the Mediterranean, how they circled Africa and even touched, Yusuf firmly asserted, the coast of America 2,000 years before Columbus. Us who, Sam had concluded, no such thing, not after all these years and all that mixing. How could there be an us? And yet, there is an us. Sam had recognized it this evening, watching those television children stacked in death against a wall, their dark eyes like the dark eyes of his nephews and nieces, of his own eyes in the old photographs, the whorled curls of their hair like his own hair, the same golden skin, those little teeth that should be smiling. Oh yes, there is an us. I'll get it for you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we're going to end with this. Um, years ago, Steve Pett asked us to write what it's like to live with a writer. Didn't you give us that assignment? Wasn't that for us? Yeah. It was in Flyway um, that it was published, and I, it was one of the things that I didn't throw out when we moved. But I don't know where it is now. Where is it? Here it is. I got it. People who know me like know I like to throw out a lot of things, and when we moved three years ago, I gave... 21 boxes of books to uh, Planned Parenthood. But apparently I had this, Steve. This is um, the literary magazine from Flyway. Steve gave us an assignment, what it's like to live with a writer. And I thought, and okay, so and I, we were in Ross Hall then. I was on the third floor. Joe was on the second. I said, let's just write this. It won't take long. Let's just do it fast. We're not getting paid for this one either. And um, I said, OK, go downstairs. I'll, I'm going to write up here. You write downstairs. Me, I'll meet you down there. It's downstairs at 5 o'clock, this essay, what it's like to, to be, live with a writer. And what is amazing, I thought, is our extremely similar last paragraphs. I wrote this. We, 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 this is something that we didn't read before uh, we submitted it. Well, I, I guess after it was approved, we submitted it. But we wrote the same thing. So this is my last paragraph about living with a writer. And then I will let Joe have the last word. Um, well, I'm going to end this now. I'm going to show my writer husband this essay, and I'm going to ask him what he thinks. And then I'm going to ask him to, then I'm going to ask to read what he wrote. Dollars to Donuts, he's not finished yet with his assignment. He is so much slower than I am. I will make the changes he suggests because I trust his writerly judgment. He will do the same. I would suppose that we've responded in the same way. This is a literary version of the newlywed game that we both feel that sharing our writer selves in such an intellectually and emotionally satisfying way is part of our relationship and that we are lucky to have found each other. I have the last word because she's directed me right where to read. <laughs> she, she wrote this in a matter of minutes. I think I was rewriting it last week. So finally, how do I feel about living with a writer? This writer? A few weeks ago, a famous writer whose work I very much admired gave a reading at our campus. He had supper with the graduate students, and a group of us ended up at our house for a dinner brandy and, an after dinner brandy and cigars. We stayed up late telling jokes and stories. I really liked this writer by the way, and probably could live with him too. 
that's because earlier on in the essay I said, uh, you know, well, can you live with a writer? Well, it depends on the writer. You know, some writers I wouldn't want to live with. At one point, the writer indicating Fern, who had just gone inside for something, remarked to me how lucky I was. I agreed, adding that Fern's parents were always telling me the same thing. <laughs> of course, the writer said, but I mean that you're two writers together. That's it, of course, how I feel, in a word, lucky. Thank you. Vernon Joe will take questions. So if anybody has one, I'll take, you, I'll take the mic to you. You want me to, you want me to, huh? I will repeat the question. And. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, I'll ask the first one to get going. Okay. Because I know um, it's really difficult to get published now. And I think both of you you're experienced me. that. I mean, you, uh, most of your work has been published at university presses. Um, Fern's book have been published by the big houses and to talk a little bit, and now the new one is published by a local house. There you go. Yeah. Um, and I, I can't pronounce I it, said, so you can okay. do it. Um, <laughs> Nobody but, can, Mikesh. So, Calicide Press. Press, here in Ames. A little mosquito. Um, okay. I said, I, I had a very fancy, very terrific New York agent for 30 years, I, and then she broke up with me, and I told people I was with Molly longer than I was in either of my marriages. Uh, and she said the business has so changed and she just wanted very few people, very just really big name people. And so this was really, really hard to get this out. There's self-publishing now, which is wonderful and also not so wonderful because you have to do a lot of stuff yourself. Um, and, and there's so much out there. So it's you can get more out there. Um, I met Mikesh, and uh, he started Calicide Press, which is a small press that I think is really going to be hot stuff, not just because you published me, uh, in Ames. And he does a wonderful, wonderful job. Um, but it, it's very hard to, you want to talk about getting published? <laughs> I, I, I don't have much to add to that, no. I, just, uh, I, I was lucky enough to uh, have the University uh, of Michigan uh, you know, uh, accept it, and uh, that, <laughs> that, that's why you know, when, in teaching creative writing, when in my, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> in teaching creative writing in my classes, when someone said to me, oh, I really want to be a writer. Oh, let's have an MFA program because I really want to be a writer. And I, I'm thinking, like, why don't you really want to be an astronaut? Are we still sending people out? It's really, really hard. And my own kids don't listen to me because they get PhDs in odd things like art theory and criticism and, you know, try getting a job in that. So, it, but being a writer, uh, making a living as a writer, is not something I would recommend to anyone today. But, okay. <laughs> Anybody else? The question yeah. is, when you self-publish, can you get it on Amazon and things like that? Yes, and I am on Amazon, and, and I'm on Amazon Live, and, on, and Joe is also on Amazon. It sounds like, you know, a marquee somewhere, but, you know, I don't know how people buy books anymore, and I don't know what's going to happen with brick-and-mortar books, but it's just, you know, it is really easy. So, yes, when you, you know, have the self-printing, you, you can't. That you, <laughs> I didn't know that. I, I don't know. You know, in the old days with the big houses, they used to go out of print, so it was like produce. It goes bad. And now I think a lot of stuff stays alive, so you can't get them. I have a copy. I'll give you one. I, the library has it. 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I mean... You, oh, Mikestra said he can redo Love Lies for me if you want. You re, do the reprint of it. No problem. No problem. There are, there are great websites, too, where you can, like, ABE books. You can go to those, and you can find out-of-print books a lot um, at varying prices. You know, if anyone wants copies of my books in German, for some reason, every time I would sell a bunch in Germany, they'd send me 10 books. And uh, so I, I, I ended up throwing away a lot of my German copies. And, uh, you know, because how many... Yeah, the cover have? of the German one, though, is like a not safe for work cover. That's why, that's why it sold so well, because it had a dirty cover with that woman. With, yeah. It had a woman with no shirt on. Yeah, it's true. And the German translation of the title was Two Women Friends. Yeah, it was... <laughs> I wore out my copy. <laughs> and I don't read German. <laughs> Anybody? What's next? I see. I knew they were going to say us. Uh, I, I, have, I have a novel in my drawer. <laughs> uh, I'm painting now. <laughs> yes. And cooking. I, you know, I think there are people who like to write. You know, I, I said, someone's going to ask us what's next. And it's like, are you kidding? We just finished this. Um, it, I really don't like to write. I like to have written. I like to get published. I like to see it. But actual writing, do you like writing? I do not. <laughs> he, Joe just started painting. Joe just, Joe just started painting. And after dinner sometimes he says, I think I'm going to go downstairs and paint some more. And I said, you know, in all the years that we've been together, you never went downstairs after dinner and said, I think I'm going to write some more. And he said, oh, I like painting so much better. It's, it's hard to write. I, maybe people like to write. Uh, we don't. <laughs> we don't. <laughs> what do you like to read? Uh, I just uh, finished a really wonderful book. Uh, I can't pronounce the writer's name. It's, I think it's Colm Toibin. 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 And it's called uh, Brooklyn. I highly, it's a, you read it? It's a knockout of a book. I, it, it just really knocked my socks off. Uh, I, Elizabeth Strout, I, I like her writing. Uh, I, I like, I, anytime we'll read Richard Yates. Right now I'm reading some Philip Roth uh, and, uh, and also some uh, nonfiction histories about Lebanon and so on. I'm in two book groups. I highly recommend being in book groups with smart people you end up reading things you wouldn't ordinarily read, like Icelandic sagas we just read, and Jane Zaring, thank you very much. And I didn't really like them all that well, but I'm glad to have read them. So I love book groups. I, I find I like more to read nonfiction as I get older. I don't know why. I, I, a lot of fiction isn't that good. but So I, I love my book groups, and, and I love um, them choosing you know, d different books. I'm also a news junkie, so I read, Joe is not. If the television is on, it's always a cooking show or gladiator movies, and I'm always going between <laughs> CNN, CNNBC. I, so I read The Atlantic and um, New York magazine, The New Yorker, and I, I just read a lot of current stuff. He's not the least bit interested in <laughs> One more? Wait, two more. Two more. Hi. Go ahead. I'll go ahead. Um, as a former student of yours, Joe, um, do you guys miss teaching? Do we miss teaching? I know the answer to this one. <laughs> Not for a minute. <laughs> I, I was surprised it was so easy to walk away from. It really was. It, uh, I, uh, <laughs> excuse me, dear. Uh, it, it, uh, it, it should have been harder than it was. And... Uh, I think it was the papers that killed me. I, 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 Fern retired after me, and, I, and there were a couple of times I went in and taught a class for her uh, after I had retired when she had to be out of town or something. And I remember going in there and teaching, and they laughed in the right places. I made the points I wanted to make. I closed up my folder, and I walked out and I thought, I'm done with this. <laughs> I miss kind of like getting up, getting dressed, leaving the house. Um, and I, I you know, <laughs> and, and I like to be 
in front of a group. But um, I, I don't. I, 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 I we love teaching when we did it, and then when we didn't, we really. It's, it was those papers that you know. It was a beautiful Sunday, this, and we had a nice day, and we read, and I don't know what else we did. And I looked at Joe, and it was Sunday night, and I said, "We have no papers to grade." So. I remember uh, uh, when I first began teaching, anxiously looking forward to the papers, waiting for them to come and reading their papers and seeing what they were doing, and really being into it. And uh, over time, over 35 years of teaching, that wore off. My question is, were you happy to leave Long Island? And if so, why? And would you like to go back? I have lived here way longer than I ever lived in New York. I did not lose my accent. In fact, I cultivated it, I think. It, it strengthened. Um, I was, I loved Iowa the minute I got here. I, I loved the big sky. I thought the people were really nice. I liked being able to walk around places. I feel a little bit temperamentally still, even though I've lived here so long, um, not a native, not I mean, I do kind of give my opinion more freely before anyone even asks. And so I think that's more of a New York thing. I like the not, no traffic. Um, I, I was happy to leave. I like to visit. I like to go back. And I'm always happy to get back to Iowa. I think it's a great place to live. Thank you all very much. I will add one more. I will plug my own hospital. The next issue of Health Connect magazine has an excerpt from Fern's book because the, um, uh, the medical experiences she talked about in her book happened at Mary Goody Medical Center. So um, look for that. Otherwise, there are books over here to buy, both Joe's and Fern's, and they will be signing. And over here will be refreshments at some point. Thank you all very much. <laughs> and rugs. Oh, and carpet. Carpet. <laughs> <laughs>